You are God all by yourself. From the beginning to the ending, there is no controversy. There is no argument. You alone are God. And that's why we honor you tonight. That's why we bless you and praise your name. That's why we magnify you and exalt you because we truly know that you alone are the only true and living God. And so, Father God, we thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to come together to bless your name, to worship you. Thank you, Father God. We honor you tonight. And Father God, in that wise, we thank you for your grace to release healing virtue over every man, every woman that has been touched, impacted, and sick by this coronavirus. We believe for their healing tonight, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And for those who are not infected, we thank you for your protective hedge, God, that they will not be touched because you said that no weapons that's formed or fashioned against us shall prosper. We stand upon your word tonight. We bless your name, Father God. You said to us in your word that we should pray for all of those who are in authority. And so tonight, God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for our local, state, and national leaders. We thank you for global leaders all over the world. God, that they will receive the wisdom from above to navigate nations through this crisis. In the name of Jesus, we bless you, we honor you. We thank you, my Lord God, that you release a special, unique grace to your body of Christ, to your church in the earth, that churches will partner together to know how to minister to your people in their need. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that in this crisis of pandemic, pandemic, my Lord God, that there will be a revival, a renewal, an awakening as to the power and the presence of God in the name of Jesus. The men and women will begin to call upon the name of, the name of Jesus and find deliverance and salvation to the glory of your name. Thank you, Father God. We bless you. Lord, we remember those who are in need tonight those who have lost jobs, those whose businesses are suffering. My Lord and my God, we thank you because you are the only one that can supply all of our need according to your riches in glory. And so, Lord, we pray for a miraculous supply in the name of Jesus. You are the one that sent the ravens to feed Elijah. There are more ravens in your hands. And so, God, we thank you for miraculous supply to all of those who are in need tonight. Thank you, Father God because you're a great God. We honor and we bless you. We praise your name for the privilege. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen. praise God, hallelujah. Well, we want to welcome you again tonight. I'm coming to you from World Outreach Church for All Nations in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and where we believe that we are raising up strong families that will serve global communities. And so we want to welcome all of you that are joining us tonight uh, in our global family. Uh, you are welcome. We thank you for allowing us to come into your space and to be a part of your family, a part of your life tonight. And I pray that something that God will share tonight will be a blessing to you, to establish you, to encourage you in the mighty, majestic name of the Lord Jesus. And so, tonight I just want to continue what I began on Sunday morning, talking about living in two worlds. I want to read from a scripture in Psalms 46, beginning from verse 1, 2, 2, 3. Psalms 46, verses 1, 2, 3, in the Passion Translation. It says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. And yes, our world is in trouble right now. Verse 2, so we will never fear even if every structure of support were to crumble away. We will not fear even when the earth quakes and shakes, moving mountains and casting them into the sea. Verse 3 says, For the raging roar of stormy winds and crashing waves cannot erode our faith in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. The reason we will not fear and the reason we will not be afraid is because of what Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 16. It says, we are not, we are, even though we are in this world, however, we are not of the world. And that's the 
point I was trying to make on Sunday morning, the fact that you and I live in two worlds. So Jesus said, we're in the world. Yeah, we are. I'm in Lawrenceville tonight. And some of you that's watching me are in Lawrenceville, Atlanta, Lagos, London, England, Sydney, Australia. You are locally, physically in a place tonight. But beyond that, if you're a child of God, apart from being in a local, physical location, you also are in heaven. That's why Jesus says, even though we're in the world, we are not of the world. Now, let me go to, another, to the scripture I began with last Sunday. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, 3. Colossians chapter 3. So the reason we will not fear is because we recognize we have dual citizenship. While we're here locally in the earth, we have a presence in heaven. So here we go. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. Now, did you, be, can you, did you hear that? Yes. Jesus, listen, the reason I am excited about the resurrection is not just that Jesus got up and that is big. That is essential to our faith. But when you understand that when he got up, you also got up along with him. That is big news. Hallelujah. This is why we all yearn that all, no, this is why we are to yearn for all that is above. For that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not the distractions of the natural realm. Do you not know right now there's a lot of distraction around us? Now, I'm not ignoring the realities of what's happening. Those things are real. But at the same time, if you don't know how to park yourself in heaven and function in the earth, you're going to be distracted by everything else. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God in Christ. Bank Akimola tonight. I am in God in Christ. Just showing up in Lawrenceville. That's the truth. Every one of you that is a born again believer, you are in God in Christ but you are just showing up in your local vicinity. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed. Why? For you are now one with him in his glory. Oh my God. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? You are now one with Christ in his glory. So the question is, is Jesus afraid tonight? Absolutely not. Is Jesus in despair tonight? No. Is he in anxiety tonight? No. Now, let me, let me say again, let me say this again. I am not ignoring the reality of what's happening. America and the rest of the world has not been the same for the last few weeks. There is no question about that. But the peace of God is never the absence of trouble. The peace of God is having the presence of God with you. And what I'm saying to us tonight is, when we recognize that our identity is in God, in Christ Jesus, that's what defines everything else around us. And to the degree that we believe this and really, 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 really embrace this reality, you are going to see that you're going to find yourself in a totally different place. Let me go to one more scriptures in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, also in the Passion Translation. This is what it says. It says, my old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives. The old man, the old bank that used to be fearful, used to be in worry, anxiety, shameful, guilty, condemned, and all the other things you want to add to it. That old man, Paul is telling us, has been co-crucified with the Messiah and no longer lives. For the nails of his cross 
crucified me with him. His death was your death. And therefore, his resurrection is your resurrection. Hallelujah. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. Folks, this is the reason we cannot be afraid. Jesus is now living his life through us. And therefore, there is nothing you and I face in this life, in this realm, that Jesus does not have the answer for. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. He lives his life through, through, he lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. My goodness, God help us tonight to understand what you have done, what you've accomplished in the finished work of Christ. If we can just understand it, it will make a whole lot of difference. The fact that his death was our death, and when God raised him from the dead, we also rose along with him. And not only that, now, the life we live is just, it's not my faith or your faith. Look at the scripture. He said, my new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God. If my new life depends on my faith, I'm in a bad shape. But my new life depends on the faith of the Son of God. Does the faith of the Son of God lack? Does Jesus' faith lack in any way? No, absolutely not. So listen to me. If you just believe the word and take it as God is saying it to us and believe it and receive it, it will make a huge difference in your life. Now let me explain, let me explain something that we can understand from what just happened uh, not too long ago. A few months back, a U.S. diplomat who lived in London, England, had an accident where she accidentally killed a British subject. Tragedy. Terrible. Our heart and prayer goes out to the family of the young man that was killed. But this is the uh, essence of the story I'm trying to tell you. Because that U.S. diplomat was an American who represented U.S. interests in England, even though she violated a local law, she was granted immunity and left England and returned to the United States without any prosecution. Do you understand the implication? Now, she lived in England a totally different world, a totally different country, where they have rules, regulations, and ordinances that guided them. But as long as she was a U.S. diplomat, an ambassador, if you, speak, if you will, she was not subject to the laws of the U.K. She received her instruction and her directions from the United States. So even though she did something that was wrong, that was tragically wrong, the laws of the United Kingdom could not prosecute her. Now, why am I interjecting that story? It's the same thing with you and I. We are citizens of heaven. We live as God's ambassadors on the earth. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 says we are the ambassadors of God. That is a fact. And therefore, we receive our instructions, our directions from heaven. And whatever we do on the earth is not because the earth is commanding us to do so, but because we are receiving instructions and we are working and doing things according to the standard operating procedure of heaven. Amen? So whatever we do on the earth, we are carrying, in, we are carrying out heaven's injunctions while on the earth. And as long as we do that, we are not going to be subject to the fears, the anxieties, the worries, and all the troubles that happens on the earth. Now, in that story I just told you, that woman who killed that young man, she could have waived her immunity. 
She could have said, you know what, even though I'm a US diplomat, I'm gonna waive that immunity and face the music. If she did that, US cannot help her. She will have to be subject to whatever happened to anybody that did that crime in the United Kingdom. That's what happened to believers. Every day we are faced with choices, with decisions we have to make, and knowingly or unknowingly, we waive our heavenly immunity. And when you do that, you become subject to all of the elements of the world or the location in which you are living in. There is no fear in heaven. There is no anxiety in heaven. There is no shortage in heaven. There is no problems in heaven. Heaven is at peace because the Prince of Peace lives and resides in heaven. Now, let me show you a scripture in 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Begin from verse 15. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15. In the New Kingdom's version, we find. That's good, thank you. All right. Look at this. And when a servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Okay, so this young man wakes up, sees all this, uh, uh, what looks like uh, an invasion, and was scared, was afraid, naturally so. Verse 16, therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and he came by night and saw another city. No, come on, verse, give me verse 16. You went back. Thank you. So what we read in verse 15, the servant saw the chariots, was afraid, went to his master, now in verse 16, so he answered, do not fear. Do you see that? Sometimes what we see in the natural will tend to bring fright into our lives. What we are beholding with our natural eyes, we say to you, oh my goodness, there's a problem. Okay? But the master said to the servant, do not fear. For there, for those who are with us, are more than those who are with them. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. This is my question to you. When did the horses and chariots show up? The horses and chariots had always been there. But this young servant didn't see it. All he saw what was, what, what, was what he was looking at in the natural. But his master, the prophet Elisha, who had the presence of God, who understood the mind of God, who was at rest in the presence of God's uh, strength and refuge. So chill. I know, I see you see enemy other. What's just chill? Not only am I seeing that, but I'm seeing something that's higher than that. So the issue here is a matter of perspective. What perspective do you have on the current situation? You can follow CNN, Fox News, NBC, BBC, all of the global news media that's given all the counts of how many people are dying, how many people are getting infected, blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on and on and on and on. All of those news only bring fright to you if you pay too much attention to them. Now, I'm not saying for you not to take precaution. Use wisdom, practice social distancing, follow the injunctions of the local governments, absolutely. Use common sense for that. But what I'm saying to you is don't be carried away by what you can sense and see through your natural eyes. Because why? There is another perspective. Elisha prays, said, God, open this man's eyes that he may see. And so my prayer for you tonight is, God, open the eyes of the numerous people that are scared, afraid, not sure, that they may see the provision you made before the crisis. Because the point is, God has a provision. He has an answer. Anything that is happening to us today that will happen to us next year, in five years, in ten years, none of those things will ever catch God unawares. 
but to the degree that you understand your identity, that you are in Christ while living on the earth, you can always function from your Christ likeness even while you're here in the earth. So now, remember that. We are in the world, but not of the world. So, ah, I'm looking at the time now. Uh, how do we see into the heavens? Elisha prayed for the servant. God opened his eyes that he may see. How? How do you and I now access what's in the heavenly? Let me go to the scripture to us. Um, John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, actually, give me Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. How? How do I get to see what's in the heavenlies? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophet. Okay, what is he doing now? Has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed here of all things, through whom also he made the wars. Verse 3, thank you. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat at the right hand of the majesty on high. So to answer the question very simply, how do we see into the heavens? We see into the heavens by simply beholding Jesus. That's what the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and is now sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father. So every time you read and see what Jesus did, Jesus is just simply opening our eyes to see what the Father is doing. His disciples were asking him in John chapter 14, uh, verse 7, verse 9 through 11, John 14, 7, 9 through 11, they were asking him, show us the Father. He said, really? You want me to show you the Father? You've been with me all this while and you're asking to see the Father? In other words, I do only what my Father does. So if you see me, you are seeing the Father. So what I'm saying to you is, when you go and read the account of Jesus' life and ministry, he, Jesus, reveals to us the mind of God in every situation. Amen? So now, let me give us some very practical steps on how to respond to coronavirus in light of the fact that we have dual citizenship. How do we respond in this hour? Number one, number one, do the word. Let me say that again. How do we respond in this season of coronavirus? Number one, do the word. Let's go to James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. James 1, 22 through 25. This is what it says. And this, this, is, this may be the only point that I'll cover tonight because I need to cover this very well. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. That's where it starts. Many of us hear the word. Day in, day out. For some of us, we have no intention of doing what we're hearing. For others of us, we may have the intention, but mm, it's not a priority. The Bible says, don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. For that is the essence of self-deception. So always let his word become like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. If you listen to the word and don't live out the message you hear, you become like the person who looks into the mirror of the word to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. You perceive how God sees you in the, in the mirror of the world, but then you go out and forget your divine origin. Now, don't forget, listen, listen to that. Your what? Divine origin. You're not just a mere man or mere woman. You are a divine entity. Don't ever forget that. 
But those who set their gaze, verse 25 now, those who set their gaze deeply into the perfecting law of liberty, which is the word of God, are fascinated by and respond to the truth they hear and are strengthened by it. They ex- now, what happens to them? They experience God's blessings in all that they do. This is a very critical point, you all. We should not just be hearers only saying, but we should become doers of the word. Now, now, that sounds so simple. Many of us will say tonight, I'm going to become a doer of the word. We're going to say it almost like we say our New Year's resolution. We're going to say it almost like we say, well, you know what, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And we start out well, and somehow, after two weeks, three weeks, maybe even sometimes before that, you can't continue. Why is that? Why do you think that's so? I want to make a very, very important point. And that point is, even though the Bible says we should, be, we should not just be hearers only, but doers of the word, you must recognize that doing the word of God is not like doing a job. No, no. Doing or obeying the word of God is not like just like I'm going to my job. I, I work at IBM, I work at Apple. I'm going to go to General Motors. I'm, I'm going to engage and do my job. No. Hear what I'm about to tell you. In order for you and I, to hear the word and do the word, we must be enabled by the Holy Spirit. (laughs) That is very, very important. The Holy Spirit has a very important role in enabling me as a believer to believe or to do the word of God. That's why Jesus said, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you a helper. If I didn't need help, he would not need to send me help. He said, when the helper is come, what will he do? He will teach me all things. He will show me. And then he says, he will guide me into all truth. Guide. You know what a guide does? Have you ever taken a tour? A tour guide shows you how to get around the tour and shows you all the intricate details of the tour you are taking. They lead you by the hand and show you how to do it. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. That it is God that is at work in me and you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So you must understand that in doing the word, in obeying the word of God, it takes the Holy Spirit to give you the enablement, the empowerment for you to be able to do it. And it works the word of God from the inside out. It does a work inside of you, and then you work it out outside of you. If there's no inner working, there can be no outer demonstration or outer manifestation. So the Holy Spirit is one that helps me and you to do the word. That's very important. Because the first point that I'm mentioning now in order to respond to to coronavirus is, number one, that we must do the word. But you have to understand, you cannot do the word in your own power and ability. It takes the help of the Holy Spirit in order to do so. Now, there's one more point on that before I move on from this point. And I want to show you the scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, in the Amplified Translation, because we're going to need it for this one. You do the word, but you understand that in doing the word, it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do so. Now, you must now appreciate the role and the place of grace in order for that to happen. Now, grace has so many, uh, we have so many definitions, we have so many people uh, talking about grace, so many controversies about grace, but let me set the uh, controversy clear tonight. Let me settle it tonight. Because if I also ask an average person, For the definition of grace, unmerited favor, undeserved favor, unearned favor. 
Yeah. I define it like that myself. The incredible generosity of God. Yeah. I define it like that myself. But let me say this tonight. Let me just make it clear, absolutely clear tonight. The unmerited favor, undeserved favor, unearned merit of God, all of those things are true where grace is concerned. But, hear me, they are incomplete. Ooh. Those things are true, but incomplete. Unmerited favor, yeah, ah, that's true. Undeserved favor, yes, that's true. Unearned favor, that's true. But let me ask you a question. Do you think God is giving me and you unmerited favor, undeserved favor, unearned favor just for me? As with everything that God does, there is a purpose. He gives the anointing for a purpose. The spirit of the Lord God has come upon me. Why? For he has anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. Recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those that are oppressed. So you see that the anointing has a purpose. There's a reason for the anointing. God is not anointing me and you and anybody else just because we want to be anointed. No. He called Moses in the wilderness. He said, Moses, Moses, I've come to you. Why? Because I want you, Moses, to go to Egypt and set the Israelites free. So the grace upon Moses for, was for what? To do something for God. So I'm saying all of that to make this point. Let's read the scripture. It is a reason for pride and exaltation in which our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world generally and especially towards you with devout and pure motives and godly sincerity, not in fleshly, there you go, not in fleshly wisdom. Watch this now. This is critical. But by the grace of God. Did you see that? By the grace of God. Now, in parenthesis, Paul, through the Amplified Bible, defines what the grace of God is. The unmerited favor, yes, we said that, check. And merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ and keeps, strengthens, and increases them in Christian virtues. This is grace defined. Summary. The grace of God, yes, it's unmerited favor, unearned favor, undeserved favor. Why? So that God will exert his holy influence upon my soul to keep or to turn me towards Christ and to keep me, to strengthen me, and to increase in me Christ-like virtues. So to say that you have grace, but you're not demonstrating Christ-like virtues, I'm sorry. I don't know what you have, but it's not grace. To say that you have grace, and it's not turning you towards Christ, <laughs> I am sorry. I don't know what you have, but it's not grace. The grace of God is given so that me and you, yes, we have unmerited favor, kindness from God, but the essence of the kindness and the favor is so that the Holy Spirit can work on us to turn us towards Christ, to behave like Christ, to think like Christ, and in time to increase within us Christian virtues. Hallelujah! If that's not showing up, I don't know what you have. That is a correct and complete definition of grace. So you do the word. You understand that the Holy Spirit empowers you to do it. And the Holy Spirit does that. It does the empowerment because of the grace of God. Amen? And so lastly, on that one point, how do I develop in grace? How do I grow in grace? 
are growing grace simply by pursuing intimacy with Jesus. Give me the scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, in the Passion Translation. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. And that's about the only point I'm going to mention tonight. I'm going to continue next week. How do I grow in grace? But continue to grow and increase in God's grace. How? It tells us. An intimacy with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May he receive all the glory, both now and until the day eternity begins. Amen. So the way I increase and grow in grace is by beholding him, by intimacy with him. The more intimate I become with Jesus, the more grace is transferred to me because I become what I behold. Mm. I become what I behold. And we know from John 1, 17, the law came through Moses. But grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is grace personified. Amen? So if I want to grow in grace, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, so I can do the word of God, I need to develop an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to end there tonight. And so I just want to say this for those of you that are out there. You are not born again yet. You are not yet in the kingdom of God. You are not a part of, you're not a part of, the, Lord, uh, of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus loves you. He died so that you can become a part of him. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, God has already forgiven your sins. It's already done. He didn't wait for you to ask. He's already done it. However, you need to receive that forgiveness. You need to acknowledge and say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. And then, and then be brought into the kingdom. And it's very simple. All God is asking you to do, accept the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for you. That's it. It's that simple. And so I want to pray for you right now. The uncertainty around us, the tumor in our world, the only refuge, the only safety net, the only one who can help you in this situation is God through his son, Jesus Christ. Everything else may fail, but Jesus will never fail. And it is his desire that you come and become a part of his great kingdom. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He didn't do so because you are good. He did so because he loves you. And it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. So right now, I want to pray for you. If you are there, just repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this privilege to hear the gospel, to know how much you love me. And I receive your incredible gift of forgiveness. Thank you for forgiving me. I receive and acknowledge the Lord Jesus. I believe with all of my heart that he died and you rose him again from the dead. And according to your word, if I believe this, I shall be saved. And so, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for accepting me just as I am into your glorious kingdom. I thank you, I honor you, I bless you. Thank you for my salvation. In Jesus' name. If you said that prayer and you meant it, welcome to the kingdom of God where you are now a born again believer. Amen. Amen. Write us, call us, send us a message, email, Facebook, whatever. Let us know what happened to you. And just so you know, these messages, these teachings continue uh, Friday noon time. We're going to have uh, noon prayer. Uh, Sunday morning, we met at 10 o'clock online, uh, where you're going to worship with us digitally. Uh, and of course, Tuesday night, we pray for our communities, we pray for the world, because we, we are called to pray and to serve our communities on Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, and uh, on, of course, on Wednesday, 7.30, I'm with you. So.